it's time to spin up our Spark cluster on Amazon EMR. This is actually quite simple using the Amazon CLI we set up in the last section. We just call AWS EMR create dash cluster. The options we need to specify are the cluster name and the release label, which tells the EMR which version of the machine setup to use. Then we also need to define what type of instances we want to use in our cluster, along with how many we want to use. Next, we specify that we want the machines to be bootstrapped with the Spark application. And finally, we specify that we want to use the default roles and key pair that we created in the last section. If you're interested in using spot instances to save money, then you can use the instance groups option in place of instance type and count. Once this has been successfully submitted for creation, we get back a cluster ID, which is useful for making future CLI calls with respect to this cluster. First, we'll monitor the cluster spin up via the EMR section of the console, choosing our newly created cluster and waiting a handful of minutes while it starts. Once the cluster is ready, we'll copy the public address of our master node so we can use it for SSHing into the cluster. First, you may have to modify the master's security group and make sure it's open to SSH. So we'll add a role to allow inbound SSH on port 22 from anywhere. Now, we pass in the identity file that we set up in the last section. If you're using a non-Windows environment, then this is the PEM file. Otherwise, it's the PPK file. Then we supply the user and public address of the master node. Note that the user is named Hadoop by default. Finally, we set up a dynamic proxy to tunnel data on port 8157. This is so that we can easily utilize the Spark instrumentation in the next section. If you're not using Windows, the command here is the same, except without PuTTY and the initial dash. If prompted, click Yes to signify that you trust the server. And once SSH'd inside, the first thing to do is set the Spark public DNS variable equal to the master's public address. Otherwise, we won't be able to fully utilize our port forwarding. With that out of the way, we can do most everything else just about the same as we do locally. Spark's abstractions make this simple for us, only caring about its distributed nature when necessary. The EMR script has even set our path and Spark home environment variables. So we can run our Spark shell just as we do locally. We don't even need to specify the master as the default has been configured to be our yarn cluster. Yarn is what's set up by the EMR script, not standalone. While the shell spins up, it should also be noted that this EMR script sets up the environment so that S3 is accessible should we need it. And as already stated, running code in the shell is the same, except when we call an action. The work is distributed across our cluster instead of running locally, since our shell is using yarn instead of local as the master. Of course, the shell is always run in client deploy mode, otherwise, how would we get input and output back and forth between the driver? Here, since we're running the shell on the cluster already, then we don't need to worry about latency anyway. Now, let's exit the shell and take a look at submitting jobs. So far, we haven't seen any proof that the work is being distributed. So for the submission, I've created a simple application that parallelizes a range from one to 10 and prints each item to the console. This println will be executed on whichever server owns the item, something which we'll be able to verify. However, being aware of whether the code is run on the driver or an executor is an important concept. As I've seen a number of users add printlins inside code blocks that will execute on the worker, yet they expect it to display to the shell or the driver. Even though Spark does a great job abstracting its distributed nature, always keep in mind that it is indeed a distributed system. Here we're using Spark Submit just as we've done before. 
Note that I've uploaded my jar to an S3 bucket, which is why I'm choosing to deploy as a yarn cluster. Spark submit in client mode does not work with remote jars. If you want to run it as yarn client, then you'll have to copy the jar to the master using a tool like SCP. Okay, our job is complete, so let's go and check our console output. First, we have to add the same SSH openness to the slave security group as we did the master. Now we'll find the public address of one of our slaves so that we can SSH into it. And there's no need to use a proxy, for all we're doing is checking for files that'll have been written out by Spark. Once SSH'd, you'll need to change to the yarn user in order to access the logs we'll be reviewing. The default location for these files in standalone is spark home slash work. However, in yarn, they're written to yarn's application container folders. In here, we need to choose our application's folder through its ID. If it was the last run, then it'll be the highest numbered folder. But you can also find the ID from the Hadoop resource manager at your master's public DNS port 9026. Or you can even find the ID from the Spark submit output. The output will have it in numerous places, but the easiest line to look for would be application app ID has started running. Once inside the application folder, you can also default to choosing the highest numbered container folder. Now we see our logs. Spark writes two files, a standard error file containing all of the log output, irregardless of the log level, and the standard out file contains some garbage collection information and all of the console output, such as our print lens. So, we can now see that our code was indeed distributed, as the RDD was printed on this slave node. This all went on one node because Spark on EMR utilizes dynamic allocation, and our job only required one node. But it was the distributed executor. Now, this log check was a bit of a hassle, right? Well, there is a better way to check on our Spark application, and we'll review that next. But before that, I want to remind you that if you're following along and plan on taking a break between this and the next section, you should terminate your cluster to avoid unnecessary charges. You can do this through the web console. If you go to your specific EMR, you can click on the terminate button. Or you can use the CLI and call AWS EMR terminate clusters passing in your cluster's ID. However, don't do that if you're following along immediately, as the next section will be a look at Spark's instrumentation using this Spark cluster.